All right, looking forward to this second hour of worship together. And Robert's going to come and read for us. Good morning. Good morning. Psalms 46, the reading of the Lord's Word. God is my refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Therefore, though not we fear, though the earth be renewed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the dwelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved, God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolation he has made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our refuge. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you now and we praise you. Lord, we know that if we try to justify ourselves, then our own mouths condemn us. If we think in any way that we're perfect, then we are perverse. Lord, you are our refuge and our strength. Lord, teach us to be still that we may hear the word of God today. Lord, for the further kin today as he delivers the word, open our hearts to receive it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take our bulletins and our inside cover, sing together this hymn to the tune of, O oh God, our help in ages past. <laughs> Or gives us wound to boast, except that Jesus crucified is not the Holy Ghost. That blessed Spirit of us is from Himself has gone, and with enlightened sinners sing salvation in the sun. He never moves a man to say, thank God I made so good, but turns his eye another way to Jesus and his blood. Great are the graces he confers, but all in Jesus' name. He gladly drinks, takes gladly hears salvation to the land. That's what makes the sheep's ears perk up. The voice of the Savior. Let's take our Bibles and look together in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Scripture reading before the message, First Corinthians chapter two. Paul writes, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. My speech, my preaching, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Albeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world, not of the princes of this world that come to naught. 
We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. For we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. These things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, that we have the mind of Christ. Oh, how blessed the people that you have taught, that your spirit has opened their hearts to know the things that are freely given to sinners such as we are by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. These things are a mystery to those that are without, but to those in whom you have revealed Christ by your spirit, we seek and desire, yearn after to know more of him. So I pray that as we gather for worship, we will be made, first of all, mindful in whose presence we are, that of a holy and just God that any acceptance in our persons must be in by and through your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, and all through his finished work. So as we sing, may we to his praise, honor, and glory as we read the scriptures, may we be always with eyes to see him, and in the preaching, may Christ alone be the glory. We pray that you will bless our meeting together in the honor and glory of your dear blessed Son, whose name I pray. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 46. It speaks of a thousand tongues to sing. That's speaking of those elect of God in every tribe, nation, and tongue, whereby Christ has paid their sin debt. Though the languages may differ, we have but one object of faith, and that is Christ. So let's stand and sing this together, hymn number 46. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great English praise. <laughs> Keep my behold 
is the word. Right? If they have preached this word and not preached Christ, they have not preached. <coughs> You're, so many talk about so and so being such a great Bible expositor because he opens the book and goes through verse by verse. I've listened to many a Bible expositor that is nothing but a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal because Christ has not been preached. Can you imagine you coming here thirsty, and I don't talk to you about Christ, the water of life. You come here hungry, and I withhold the bread. That's not preaching. Preaching is to declare Christ, even as we read in the scripture in 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. It takes a determined. Even in our getting together with one another, it takes a determining to talk of Christ and Him crucified. Because it didn't take much to get us off track. Like that man that had all these little cats lined up on stage, and they were all performing exactly as he wanted to do until somebody in the audience turned the mouse loose. And then all of a sudden, they're off chasing the mouse, and the, the director is calling after his cats. That's the way we are. It doesn't take much to get us flipped. We have to determine what is of value, even in our relationships one with another. As speaking of Christ to one another, being crucified, his death, our Lord continues to teach us. And so that's what we see again here in the scriptures. It's Acts chapter 18. And here Paul had departed from Athens and saw the beginning gone to Corinth and we saw how the Lord purposed that Jewish couple Aquila and Priscilla should also depart from Rome but they departed from Rome and he met them there in the Corinth the boat there they had the same craft and we see where this was Paul's custom in verses 4 and 5 he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. It wasn't that he agreed with what was going on in the synagogue, but that's where the scriptures were read. And so it was an opportunity for him, as it says there, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews of his day had the thought, like so many today, that the Old Testament scriptures, that's just for the Jews. No, it's, it's the word of Christ. The Old Testament, as in the New, and it pertains to Jew and Greek. Uh, Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia. Paul was pressed in the spirit and says, testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, Christ must be preached. That's Old and New Testament. A lot of people think today, well, we preach Christ from the New Testament, the Old Testament, it has to do with all. No, it all had to do with Christ. From Genesis all the way through Malachi. So, here we see then in verse 24 that a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, says of him he was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. We have Paul over in Corinth, and we have now the Lord directing this one Apollos to Ephesus. It was there that Paul had left Timothy as well to preach to those that the Lord had brought together in, in the assembly. And it says of him that this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. How was he instructed in the way of the Lord? The same way that any of us know the way of the Lord. It's going to be by his spirit. If you read 
there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, taking these scriptures and opening unto us Christ. And being fervent in the Spirit, again, I don't know why sometimes the translators put these words in a little s. It wasn't that he was just fervent in his spirit, but he was fervent in the Spirit. The very Spirit of God, that's the only way to know the Lord. And that spirit then directing him in that fervent spirit to testify of Christ and crucified. I know people don't understand that. They say, well, if you believe God elected those, he's going to say that Christ died for those the Father gave. Why even preach? I'll tell you this. If God has ever revealed Christ in your heart, that very spirit of Christ in you, motivates and moves you with that urgency to speak of others of him it's not that we're trying to get people saved like we use that term today but we like to speak with the one we love you can hop in on a conversation with somebody that doesn't take long to find out when they're talking about somebody in very affectionate terms that that's somebody they love so your ears perk up to find out what you're talking about that was a policy. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Now here's the part that perplexes some because it says knowing only the baptism of John. You have to understand that they didn't have tweeting back then. They didn't have texting. They didn't have email where news could travel fast. And from my studies, what I understand about Apollos, he would have been one of those that had come to Jerusalem and would have seen the outpouring of the Spirit in Jerusalem. He would have been one that knew of the baptism of John, whereby John had preached even before Christ the Messiah was publicly revealed, knowing that the Messiah should come and would have been baptized himself in that baptism, believing as John preached the Lamb of God, believing that he that should come, he, John, would not even be worthy of losing the latches of him. the sandals of this man. He must increase, I must decrease. So Apollos, during this transition, would have known and believed the scriptures that the Messiah should come. The problem is, then, as he went his way, and news traveled would not necessarily have seen all of this as being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's how it could be said here that he had the Spirit of the Lord when he went to the Scriptures, when he preached the Scriptures. He was preaching that one who should come. According to what John the Baptist preached, behold the Lamb. And so as he spake, verse 26, taking the Scriptures, but always preaching that this one should come. It says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard. So now you see why the Lord even had Aquila and Priscilla to be there at that time while Paul was off in Corinth serving the word, ministering the word. Here now he makes the acquaintance of Aquila and Priscilla. And it says, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. It wasn't that he was preaching a false message, but they expounded unto him by saying to him, Apollos, you clearly have an understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. You're clearly declaring that this one who should come should laid down his life in fulfillment of all of the Old Testament sacrifices and types of pictures as the way of God, but do you know he has already come? And as they explained unto him, took them aside, not in a critical manner, but in a desire to, as it says here, expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. It's like when I preach, as much as I preach what the Lord has taught me by his grace and mercy. There's still portions of this scripture 
that I love when I finish preaching, one of you or somebody may write and say to me, as you were preaching, have you ever considered how that particular portion really speaks of Christ and Him crucified? And it may be something I completely missed. I believe that Christ is the fulfillment of all of Scripture, and yet I still am learning. I still, even though the Spirit of God is in me and makes me fervent, intelligent in the things of the Lord, yet I'd be the first to confess that there are parts of the Scripture where I need to have the teaching of the way of God expounded unto me more perfectly. And I believe that this is where we see how the Spirit of God was working both in Aquila and Priscilla, as well as in Apollos. That even though he was eloquent in the Word, knowledgeable in the Word, and diligent to things of the Lord, yet he himself needed to be explained the way even more perfectly. And I believe that that's the sense there. It's not that he was preaching a false message and now all of a sudden he realized, oh, I was preaching a false message. He was declaring that Christ should come, the Christ, and should fulfill everything that was written in the Old Testament concerning him. And yet they were able to pull him aside and say, he has come. And I can imagine their conversations going back to scriptures, using the scriptures, expounding the scriptures, concerning how even in every part that pertains to Christ. I have people, they hold you to account now, because when you tell them every scripture pertains to God, pertains to Christ and his son and him crucified, they'll pop it out on you and say, I was reading this scripture, tell me how that pertains to Christ. I've got to take pause and look at it. And sometimes I have to ask, well, you ask the question, how is the Lord teaching you? And they'll begin to tell me how they see Christ in that particular scripture. And I look at it, and I, I'll tell them. I'm not in any way prideful to think that somehow you can't teach the preacher. But when someone points to me from the scriptures and shows me from those scriptures explaining the way of God more perfectly, how that pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ, I rejoice. And I let them know, I'm thankful that the Spirit of God has so taught you because just as he's made it a blessing to you, so it's a blessing to me. And so that's what I believe took place here with Apollos. And after that, I can imagine him, now that the light comes on, because he was out of we don't know in Scripture anywhere where he would have been taught other than by the Spirit of God. He certainly would not have learned this in the synagogues. When it says up there in verse 24 that he was mighty in the Scriptures, I believe that's how the Lord used the Apostle Paul. He wonders sometimes because they weren't carrying around little scrolls of the Scriptures like we have our Bible today. And stand and preach and say, okay, now turn to Acts chapter 18 or Isaiah something. They, this had to be from the Spirit of God and the memory as they studied the Scriptures. That's the sense here. He was eloquent, mighty in the Scriptures. The Lord purposed that he should come to Ephesus at that particular time. Not to boast or to have people listen to him and say, wow, what an eloquent preacher though. But every part of this the Lord would use to direct the hearts of his elect in that place to Christ in the scriptures. And so it says there in verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Who, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded him the way of God more perfectly. I can imagine after that, his boldness even greater. Now that the Lord had so used them to explain the way more perfectly. It says, when he was disposed to pass unto Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through the grace of God. And he mightily convinced the Jews. There again, it wasn't him doing the convincing, but the Spirit of God through him convinced the Jews. And that publicly... 
Here it is. What is it that the Lord is pleased to use? Showing, declaring by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. I know as the Lord has been pleased to teach me that whenever I sit down with this word, knowing that I'm going to be preaching from it, that's the very first thing, my starting point. I had someone ask me that one time, I said, where do you start when you're going to prepare a message? We'll start with Christ. But one old preacher said that if Christ isn't in the preparation of the message, if Christ isn't in the presentation of the message, then it's a crime. And I'll tell you, that, that helps the focus. If we know that all of Scripture, I don't care where it is, the law, the prophets, the New Testament, if all of Scripture does not declare him, then anybody that preaches this word is preaching a lie. Taking this word, they might be the most eloquent, they might know many scriptures, be mighty the scriptures, but unless they're taught of the Spirit and that they preach, here it says that Jesus was the Christ, that they haven't preached the word. I told you before about that example of a young man who was just itching to preach. And there was an elder preacher there in that congregation that just kept holding them off. And uh, finally one day the preacher told him, said, okay, next time you preach. So the young man was diligent about preparing his studies, and studying the, the text, and putting his message together, and coming up with an outline and all these things. And so when it was his turn to preach, he got up in front of the people and he preached away. And then when he sat down afterward, the elder preacher, as was the custom there, they were, he was at the door and this young man came back to him. And he said, well, what did you think of the message? The old preacher said, it was very poor. And of course, the young man's shoulders slumped. What do you mean, poor? think I prepared enough? He said, no, I can tell you, you prepared very well. well. Was there something in the presentation that wasn't logical, didn't have all my, my points? He said, you were well prepared there, had the structure and everything. And the young man, confused, asked the preacher, well, what was poor about it? He said, you didn't preach Christ. And uh, the young man responded, said, well, Christ wasn't in the text. And that's where the old preacher said, Christ was there, and you just didn't cut the path to him. And that's stuck with my mind. I think back times, I preach this word. Of course, when you preach and it's recorded, I go back sometimes and listen to some of those messages, and I'm thinking that poor message, poor message, preached all around Christ, but not Christ. And the older I get, the longer I preach. Or that determination not to know anything among us say Jesus Christ and him crucified. So why do you why do you preach Christ from the scriptures? Well, number one, that's the word. He is the word. Apart from him, there's no blessing. You can't call a person a Bible preacher if they're not preaching Christ as he is here in the scriptures. Here you notice it says in verse 28 that. He mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing the scripture that Jesus was the original is the Christ. There is no other. You say, well, why preach Christ from the scriptures? Well, he's the word, but also there is no coming to Christ. There's no heart that has ever been turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, except for that which by the word Christ has been revealed. There's a bunch of people today running around that have been persuaded of a decision for Christ. They're persuaded of a Jesus that was preached to them, but they've never taken the time to search the scriptures like the Brians did with the Apostle Paul to see if these things be so. Many people don't want to hear it because it's like that ostrich that's got his head in the sand. They made up their mind, don't confuse me with, with the truth. People will hold on to their profession with a death grip. They'll plug their ears if in any way you preach the Christ of Scripture in a way and a manner where they've been taught otherwise. It's a death grip. It's 
like that man that was dying and the uh, preacher went to him and asked him if he believed he had a good hope and his only answer he could give was I have a good hope if you've been telling me the truth if our hope is built on anything less than Jesus' blood and righteousness we dare not trust the sweetest friend that's why people, when they get in trouble, like to call the pastor. They want to be reassured that that pastor's not your hope. And if the Lord himself has not been pleased with your Christ and you according to the scriptures, then there is no hope. And so we see re-emphasized, even in this particular portion of scripture, how the Lord uses his preachers to say, well, how can I recognize a true preacher? I get people... They write me from time to time. They want me to recommend a preacher. And they'll mention whatever city they're in. And I'll tell them, I don't know of any gospel preacher in that city. Why? There seem to be a lot of good churches. I say, well, that word seem says everything. There's a way that seemeth right unto man. At the end thereof are the ways of death. These are death houses. Congregation. These were death houses where Paul and Apollos went in to preach. These were synagogues, and yet without the knowledge of Christ. But what we're reading about here is how the Lord was pleased to bless this preaching of Christ and Him crucified to the hearts of those within those congregations that God had already elected and for whom Christ had already paid the debt. And hearing the testimony of Christ, hearing of Christ and Him crucified, then the Lord by His Spirit drew them to Him. And I'll tell you, as you read on, you find out they didn't stay there long. They weren't welcome. Maybe they were found there of the Lord, but when the Lord opened their hearts to reveal Christ unto them, they came out. They were brought out. Even as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, come out and be separate, saith the Lord. There's no mixing of worship with those that have never been taught. Our attachment is to the scriptures and to what this word teaches us concerning Christ. But secondly, this matter of preaching Christ, there's no jealousy among the preachers of Christ. Men like to make a difference. They like to consider, well, this preacher here, I like to hear better than that one. And this is ultimately the problem that developed there in first in Corinthians, Paul's over in Corinth preaching. Apollos, when it says there he, he passed into Achaia, that's over in that area where, where Paul was preaching. But Paul never said, no, you stay in your territory and I'll stay here. Wherever the gospel is preached, there's a rejoicing. I don't care who it is. If someone asks me, well, do you know so-and-so? And I may say, no, but what do you like about it? I actually had a, an email a couple weeks ago, somebody over on the East Coast that wrote me and said, the more I listen to you, the more it sounds like my preacher. And so I want to know his name. Not to contest, but I want to go here. And one of the things that is good about our day and age is most of it's out there on the internet anyway. So you can sit and listen to what men are saying. It's not that we delight in being the only one where we can find fellowship, we rejoice, but that fellowship has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no boasting of who we are versus the ministry of another. I know the Pharisees tried to put a divide between John the Baptist and Christ, saying to him, don't you know they're more following him than you? And John the Baptist rejoiced. He said, that's the way it ought to be. I didn't come here to gather people after my name. He must increase. I must decrease. And so, but you know, flesh is flesh. Over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll see how Paul had to write back to the Corinthians at one particular point addressing the carnality of those in the congregation. When it says carnality, it means the flesh. Remember, back in the day, there were some that said, well, there's carnal Christians, there's nominal Christians, and then there's spiritual Christians. And there's that crazy little chart whereby 
it had uh, Christ in the throne, and if you were a, a nominal Christian in name only, then the throne was outside of the heart over here, as if Christ had no reign over you. And then the, the, the carnal Christian was one by the throne, you'd accepted Jesus, so the throne was inside the heart, but no one on the throne. You'd accepted Jesus as the Savior, but not the Lord. But the spiritual Christian was one now, and they put a little cross on top of that throne. That That's what you aim for. That's what you want to be. Well, that's foolishness. There's never been any sinner converted to Christ whereby he does not reign. And he is overall. So the sense here in 1 Corinthians 3 is not carnal in the sense of fleshly, in the lusts of the flesh, and Christ not being on the throne. No, he said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual ones in whom the Spirit was, but as unto carnal. That word means fleshly or immature, even as unto babes in Christ. So he acknowledges that these are babes in Christ. Newly converted. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. You have to recognize, and people remind me this all the time as I'm preaching even for you. You've heard me preaching now for over 23 years here. And it'll be 24 in August. And so things that I declare unto you as once taught of the Lord, it's like meat. You can sink your teeth into it and take it from there. But as others come in, I'm often mindful when we have visitors that we better start back at ABC here. In fact, I've had some tell me that. I can always tell when you have a visitor in your congregation because you go back to the basics. It's like teaching somebody to read. This is A, B, C. And you lay it down so simply and plainly. But those... Even the mature, they rejoice in that. It's good to hear the fundamentals again because that's what the Lord has been pleased to reveal in our heart. And wherever I hear of somebody that in the clear, plain, simple declaration of Christ in his person as the God-man, but also his work, that when he came to this earth and lived that perfect life and laid down his life as a sacrifice to the satisfaction of God the Father, that is salvation. It's not how I see it, it's how the Lord is pleased to reveal it. And if someone asks, well, when were you saved? Well, it was purposed in eternity, but it was accomplished in Calvary. And I just found out about it. The Spirit of God was pleased to take and reveal unto me that, Ken, you are that sinner for whom Christ paid the debt. And so Paul is reminding them, I've fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Now the reason he's saying that is when I was with you in Corinth, I wasn't assuming that you understood all these things, so I taught you as a, considered to be like a first grade teacher, teaching you the the elements, the principles of, the, of the, the gospel. But the reason why he's saying that is because here now along comes Apollos, who was well taught in the scriptures. And Paul seems to speak in the terms of as a speaker, he was not considered to be that good of a public speaker. When he says he preached with fear and trembling, it was not only the content of what he had to preach, but fear and trembling in the sense that he was looking to the Lord as to how he should preach what he did. But he says here in verse 3, Ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Anywhere you get a bunch of preachers together, people are going to line up. Now I like this one better than I like this one. And I, I like to hear this one better than this one. What does he say in verse 4? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Aren't you reasoning 
as fleshly men in even making a comparison between the servants of God. You can go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This was a real issue here. In verse 12, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I of Apollos and I of Cephas, that would be Peter. And then some were saying, I'm of Christ, as if they had some better understanding. He asked the question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Christmas and Gaius lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. He's describing ways that people fleshly think in terms of their own standing in uh, their salvation. He said, I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So you wonder, well, why preach Christ from the Scriptures? That's it. It's because He is the Word. It's the only way that God, His purpose, the sinner's heart should be turned to Christ and be drawn to Him. And so Paul, over here at 1 Corinthians 3, continues this subject. As long as you're looking at the servant and not to the same, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? I love this. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed. What he's saying is that God is a God of means and he uses ministers that he raises up, having taught them of Christ, then to turn the hearts of others to him, those that, for whom Christ has died, paid their debt. He says, even as the Lord gave to every man, beware of ever elevating a preacher above the word and above Christ. But John the Baptist declared, applies to me or any other that the Lord brings to declare Christ and him crucified. He must increase. I must increase. All said, I have planted. Notice, he doesn't, he's, there's no jealousy here about pots. Uh, he, Paul was learning about how people were attracted to a pots for the very same reasons we're reading here. He was mighty in the spirit. Spake, he taught diligently the things of the Lord. Expounded the way of God. And by that Many believed. The underlying thing there is that if you're counting heads, that's why Paul said, I'm not counting heads. I, don't, I can't tell how many are baptized, but some were counting heads, thinking, well, there's more being converted under Apollos than under Paul. What does that have to do with it? That's just the Lord blessing through the ministry of one over above the other. I've often said that if the Lord brings me one of his sheep, and tells me for the rest of your life, I want you to feed that sheep. I'll rejoice. Because it's the Lord's sheep. That's not what people are looking for. I've had people say that about our meeting place here. How big is your congregation? You know, how long have you been preaching? Oh, that long? And it's still that small? It doesn't matter. Now, others say that. And it's interesting because I preach as if there were a thousand here. I never know. This is all being recorded. I don't know where the Lord will be pleased to bless it. It's for the Lord to do that. But sometimes we're two or three gathered in his name. And I've had people when I tell them, they go, really? You never tell that from the way you're praising. Well, if the Lord brings one needy sinner, even if I'm the only one, <laughs> and some of you laugh because I've actually started our meetings sometimes where I'm the only one. But I know there's some people waiting, so I just get up and start Start the service, and then they come. It doesn't matter. It's that the Lord be pleased to use a minister, a servant, that's what that word means, such as I, to reveal Christ unto his sheep. But as it says there in verse 5, even as the Lord gave to every man. 
That's the amazing thing about preaching. You can have a room full, everybody hears the same message, but it's as the Lord gives to each one. One will get up and go out and think, I didn't hear anything today, did you? And the other will say, I was so blessed by that word. What makes you the different? It's the Lord, not the servant, the Lord. He said, I have planted, all this water, but what? God gave the increase. There are times that I have preached and the seed has been sown, and the person's gone their way, and I never know how the Lord has been pleased to bless the word, but sometime later, I'll get a communication from that individual that will say to me, you know, remember back when you preached this message? I always laugh when people say that, because I don't. I, I preach in the moment as the Lord directs, and then I'm on to the next. So many times people will say, well, you said this in the message, and I say, well, I have to go back and listen. But it always rejoices my heart to where, whether I know about it or not, this individual will write and say, it wasn't until years later that that seed that you preached, as another was preaching, and opened the scriptures, the Lord brought that word back to my heart, and I'm just writing to thank you. It's not that we look for any glory or thanks in and of ourselves, but it says the Lord gives the increase. I'm thankful. I'm good with that. The others, true the same way, where some will come in and sit down, having heard the word preached, and yet never having sat under a minister where every time the word is opened, that Christ is set forth. But the the soil has been prepared. Just like I said, I planted a pot of water. And I've had some come in, and as they've sat and listened, they've said to me, you know, as I listened to the word before, I could tell it was the word being preached, but sitting here listening now, the Lord has made his word so much more plain to my heart as to how this all pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. I rejoice. I can't take the glory in that. It says God gives the increase. And look at this in verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything. Don't remember the preacher. It's not the preacher. Neither he that watereth anything. Well, that takes the air out of the moon, doesn't it? But God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are what? One. If they're the Lord, so they taught that taught of Him. So that's why when Apollos came along, and Aquila and Priscilla were used to to instruct him in the way of God more perfectly, that he became actually not a competitor of Paul's in the preaching, but one. That's in that he rejoiced. He said, "He that planteth, he that watereth, the one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor." When it talks about receiving his reward, what is the gospel preacher's reward? It's not some reward in heaven, crowned there with stars and all that. No, the reward is the rejoicing and seeing how the Lord blesses and bringing forth fruit from the seed that's been sown and preached. What farmer doesn't rejoice after having sown the field and cultivated it that when the harvest comes now, he partakes of that harvest? That's his rejoicing. I ask these Farmers in Africa, because it's it's hard labor. They go out and they clear the field, cut it with a machete, and tear up the roots, and lay the soil, and dig it in, and then they sow the seed, and then they've got to go back and cultivate, because it's a very humid climate out there, and the weeds grow faster than the harvest or the, the seed, and so they're busy about this in the heat of the sun. And I've, done, I've talked to some of them about that. I said, well, why do you keep at it? And they, they, they said to me, there's nothing that tastes better than that first rice that the wife has cooked up. She said to pound the seed and separate the chaff from the rice. And there it is. She cooks it up and puts it in that sauce. She said, you just sit back and think, oh, it was all worth it. That's the labor. That's, that's what Paul's talking about here of each man receiving his reward according to his own labor. Now, there's some that others preach for, and I don't know them that well. They are sitting under <coughs> gospel preachers, and I thank the Lord that 
Can you imagine if, if there was just one of us having to do all the preaching for all the sheep? That would be that would be hard to, to bear. But each one the Lord has placed his servants where they are. But I'll tell you that whatever reward in the preaching that they're seeing, where the Lord has raised them up and they're rejoicing in, it's nothing like the reward that I enjoy preaching for you. Because here are those that the Lord has been pleased to teach. And I'm thankful that it's his work to do. And that's what Paul's talking about there. They receive their own reward according to their own labor. For we are laborers together with God. That's what's important to remember. We are laborers together with God. He's got a means. And people say that. Well, if I believe like you did, that God has done all the choosing and Christ has already accomplished it, then why preach? He told me if I if, if that was me, I wouldn't even preach. And I've responded by saying, Well, if I believe what you do, that God hasn't chosen anybody, and now it's up to you to go out there and win them, I wouldn't preach. How are you going to turn a hardened heart? How do you give life to a dead heart? That's God's to do. But the seed is Christ, and that through all of the scriptures. I would give each of you an assignment here. Sometimes we have our favorite portions we like to go and read because the Lord has opened our eyes clearly to Christ, and we love to go back there. Just pick a portion where you don't see Christ, and then read it, and study it, and pray, and ask that the Lord open that scripture to you to see Christ. Look for him. He's there. Whether we see him or not, he's there. But we're laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And so he says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. And here it is, the summit. No other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What Paul is doing is really quoting from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Go back there, Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. All of Scripture pertains to Christ, preaching Christ from the Scriptures. Here we read, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. This work of salvation, what is that stone? That's the stone that the builders rejected. That is the self-righteous religious people of the day. But it was God's stone. And it says here a tried stone. It's speaking there of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when preaching Christ from the scriptures, it's not just people preaching his word. He is that stone. But it's preaching his work. A tried stone. One that had to be tested in all things yet without sin. A precious cornerstone. That word precious means without price. You can't put a price to it. The cornerstone. He laid this cornerstone in his death. A sure foundation such that any that are laid upon, they could never be moved. I'm thankful. That's the Christ of Scripture. And it says here, he that believeth shall not make haste. I was watching this week earthquakes in California and as the buildings started to shake people in the panic running every which way why is that they didn't trust the building they had to try to find safety somewhere else but I'll tell you that any of us that have been laid on this foundation by the Spirit of God when Christ shed his blood it was for that full free and final salvation justification before God when the storms come and the winds blow, we're not in a panic. I'm talking about sometimes the doubts within and, and the afflictions from without. It, could, it would shake any person. But being built on that foundation of Christ, it says here, he that believeth shall not make haste. We're not running around in a panic, thinking, oh, Christ is coming back soon, or you know today might be your last day, oh, I better get my house in order. All of that is a, is a panic running of people that don't know Christ. When someone asks me, when you come to that moment of death, 
what is going to be your hope. My hope is this, that when Christ died, he died for me. That's it. Other than that, I have no other hope. And I believe God. How do I believe God? His spirit, having taken this word. And that's why I love to go back and read it. This is a whole library right here that we'll never master in this lifetime. But every time we open it, oh, for eyes to see Christ and see that work that he's accomplished. Any other hope? You can see there is described in verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line. And righteousness to the plummet. That's the plumb line. It determines what's straight and what isn't. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. How many people I can imagine what is going to eternity? People thinking of a God that does not exist because someone's told a lie. And to face then the holy God without the representation of the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of their profession. It's like hail sweeping away the refuge of life. And the water is overflowing the hiding place. Our confidence is in the Lord. And uh, I'm thankful. These scriptures we have to hold in our hand and reveal him and continue to teach us of him. And that we're greatly blessed. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing one final hymn 207. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice. We do come willingly, but it's according to God's will. On thee, my Savior, my God. Let's stand and sing this together. Oh, happy day, I fix my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell his raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus walked. Sins away. He taught me how to wash and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washes my sins away. Oh, happy bond that seals my vows to him who merits all my love. Let cheerful lands fill this house, God's human sacred shrine I move. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. To son and pray, transaction son, I am my Lord's and he is mine. He drew me and I followed on, trying to confess the voice divine. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Now rest my long divided heart, faced on this blissful center rest. Forever from my Lord depart, with him of every good possess. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. That word happy means blessed. You can't be any more blessed than Christ, what he's accomplished. All right.
have a good rest of the day. Look forward to the next time.